scientific insights uh, that uh, Professor Spawns will share, so we want to make use of the time today. So welcome everyone to our seminar in the Cutting Edge Advances Towards Personalized Mental Health seminar series. I'm ab absolutely thrilled that all of Spawns is joining us today. Um, a real uh, absolute uh, leader and pioneer in our field in developing and discovering the human connectome and really cutting edge functional connectivity techniques and outcomes that you'll hear about today. Um, as many of you would know, um, Professor Spawns is the Robert H. Shaffer Chair, a distinguished professor and a provost professor in the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences at Indiana University in Bloomington. Indiana. He has an uh, incredible record of publication and contribution to how we understand networks of the human brain and two books, uh, Networks of the Brain and Discovering the Human Connectome. We're delighted to have him here. Um, I will introduce myself as well. Um, Leanne Williams, I'm the director of the Center for Precision Mental Health and Wellness, uh, hosting this seminar series. And one house or oh, two housekeeping points before we kick off. Um, one is if you have questions as we go, we won't ask them live as we go, but please put them in the chat and then uh, you'll have the opportunity to ask them at the end of the presentation, which will be 1130 uh, local time. And Professor uh, Spawns has kindly offered to stay on to answer more detailed questions afterward. So without further ado, uh, welcome again. We're delighted to have you here. Uh, over to you. Thank you very much, Leanne. I, I uh, look forward to this. I remember my visit uh, at your center uh, six years ago or so it must have been. And um, I, uh, I look forward to sharing with you a few uh, more established results in the field, but also some new stuff that we've just been working on the last couple of years uh, during the time of, of pandemic and lockdown. Um, well, uh, the way my talk is going to go is uh, I'm going to uh, briefly introduce network neuroscience. It takes less and less time to do that. More and more people are working in this area, so there's less for me to say each time I, I cover this. We all know what nodes and edges are, networks and so forth. Um, say a few words about human and comparative model organism connectomics, and then uh, launch into the main uh, part of the talk today, which is about brain dynamics and functional connectivity. Of course, as many of you know, um, the last um, couple of decades or so have seen a really dramatic expansion of network approaches in neuroscience. I date back to a time when networks were not a big topic in neuroscience at all. So for me to have witnessed all this is, is really quite, quite amazing. Um, of course, you know that we are now dealing with network data coming from invertebrate species such as C. elegans, from, uh, from rodent brains, from non-human primate brains, and of course, also from human brains, both structural and functional connectivity. And um, network analyses and models and, 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 and network models have taken on an ever greater um, uh, prominence in our field. And in part, this is driven by experimental technology, uh, greater and greater ability to record uh, relational data from uh, interactions between molecules all the way to interactions among individual human beings. In the middle of this spectrum is that large space of connectomics, and within that, the space of functional connectivity and fMRI that I will mainly uh, spend my time on today. Uh, and we, uh, we now have a field on, uh, in, on our hands that really uh, we can describe as, as network neuroscience uh, because it deals with networks at different levels of scale and, and spatial and temporal resolution with a common thread of network architecture, graph theory, network modeling that converges, uh, that leads to convergence between molecular, synaptic, anatomical, functional, and even behavioral social networks onto a common space of graph theory and network analysis. Uh, core topics here, as you all know, um, are things like uh, degree uh, clustering, uh, nodes and edges, paths, communication paths between uh, sets of nodes that have to traverse the network, and community detection, 
uh, densely clustered sets of nodes that are more densely connected internally and we more weakly connected between, which also leads us to the definition of hubs, critical nodes that hold the architecture together as a whole. Much has been written in this space, and I will briefly cover a few of the highlights coming from human and model organism connectomics, mainly staying in the space of anatomical or structural connectivity. When I first got started in neuroscience, what we knew about the human brain, anatomically speaking, came largely from histological dissection, which has obvious disadvantages. And it was only in the last 20 years or so, 15 years really, uh, that we have gotten access to the architecture of uh, human brain anatomy through the use of non-invasive neuroimaging technology. And, and that was a transition that, 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 I, that I witnessed and it was really enormously uh, interesting to see. Working with Patrick Hagman some 15 years ago now, we set out to map some of these putative white matter tracts between uh, cortical regions in the human brain and started building network matrices, connection matrices that looked like this. This is the actual first example of a, a connectome matrix that we constructed uh, in 2007, 2008. And uh, we are out, we're now quite familiar in the field with these constructs, essentially descriptions uh, in, a, in matrix form of which pairs of regions in cortex in this case are connected and how strong that connection is. Coming from, from diffusion imaging and tractography, those connections are undirected and they can be weighted. Uh, so this is a weighted sparse uh, symmetric matrix of connectivity that we proposed some years ago now to call a connectome, a complete set of connections, an ohm in that sense of connections in the human brain. And in my, in my mind, still today, a very, fun, very foundational uh, data set that we must possess to understand what the human brain is actually doing. Uh, Connectome has become uh, almost mainstream at this point. It's um, almost become part of the sort of the, uh, the public consciousness in cognitive neuroscience. But again, 15, 20 years ago, it was a much, much smaller or even non-existent concept. So lots of things uh, that we originally gleaned, Patrick and I, in our very first study carried out on a grand total of five subjects. <laughs> um, uh, many of the themes that we found, architectural features, uh, have been found again and again. They are listed here, unique uh, fingerprints, uh, unique sets of inputs and outputs for each cortical region, heavy tail degree distribution, presence of high clustering and short path length overall, those are hallmarks of small world connectivity, the existence of densely connected clusters of regions or modules which are interlinked by hubs and the tendency of these hubs to form uh, structural cores as we called them originally or later on rich clubs. Those, feature, those features of anatomical uh, human connectivity have been found over and over again in many different species, uh, showing you here a, a brief summary of some of the uh, species people have looked at over the years, many more uh, at this point, Drosophila, evidence of modular architecture in uh, the Drosophila brain at, at mesoscale. scale, uh, same evidence of mod modular architecture in the rodent brain, the mouse in this case, as well as rich club architecture as well, and rich club regions in the non-human primate. It is important to establish these features of connectivity in model organisms because these features are arrived at through observational technique and tracking and tracing of pathways that do not rely on imaging, but rely on invasive methodologies such as fluorescence imaging or track tracing. Um, we are currently underway uh, to look at uh, um, a, a more comprehensive comparative analysis in over 70 mammalian species and uh, have a, a bunch of papers in the pipeline about which I will not say very much today. Uh, one last line of, of work in the uh, model organism space that I'd like to highlight here is work that I've carried out over the last several years with Larry Swanson at USC. Uh, Larry is a, a neuroanatomist, as all of you know, and, and is looking, especially in the rat brain, at connections between uh, regions in the rat brain that, that have been histologically determined. And what you see here is a directed weighted connection matrix of the rat, uh, I believe the, the rat end brain that um, records all of the connections, watch virtually all of them uh, in that assembly of regions, essentially cerebral cortex and basal ganglia, and tells us uh, also about modular arrangements of these um, 
of these uh, of, of these regions with each other, which we find we find evidence for. Importantly, these connection reports come from classic histological in investigation, invasive uh, tracing, fluorescence tracers, and other tracers used in the, in, in the rat brain, so they're not based on imaging. Uh, one last point about this is that what, what Larry and I have done over the years is we've especially looked at the modular architecture of different subdivisions of the rat brain uh, using a technique that looks at modules or communities of densely connected regions, not just at one level of scale, but across multiple levels of scale. And for methodological reasons that I don't have time to get into it, it's very important to do that because most modularity detection algorithms that we use also very uh, prominent in functional connectivity uh, have scale sensitivity and, and we need to actually uh, look at uh, different scales and then build a consensus matrix from that, which we have done in our work with, with Larry and the in the rat brain, what we typically get is what we call a so-called co-classification matrix, which for each pair of nodes records the propensity or, or probability with which that node pair is found in the same module across multiple scales. So a bright signal here means that those pairs of nodes are very, very highly affiliated, always together, no matter where we look in, 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 in the scale hierarchy. And a dark signal means there's almost no affiliation. This gives us a graded matrix of modular uh, co-classification that we can use for detecting modules across different scales and building a hierarchy of modules. This is very important in the RAT space, RAT, the RAT literature space that we've been looking at with Larry, but also important in the, in the functional connectivity space to which I will turn in just a minute. If you're interested in this methodology, it's been described for a number of years now in literature and we've used it. And there's a GitHub page with code if you want to apply it to your own data sets. I'll now turn over to the main part of the talk and uh, and also uh, present a few studies that, I ha that I've not presented before, actually, that are quite new. So bear with me in case I'm getting lost in detail. Brain dynamics and functional connectivity uh, are two topics that, of course, are of core importance to anybody interested in individual differences and in interested in, in, in observing individual differences in the human brain. What I've talked about so far deals with the space of anatomical connectivity shown here on the left. This is our rendering lateral view of the human connectome from the two, original 2008 study. On, on relatively short time scales, we may think of the anatomy as relatively fixed, especially at this level of scale, uh, this macro scale of, of anatomical tracts. On the right, on the other hand, is a resting, uh, a resting state MRI time series that's been projected back onto the cortical surface. I show this movie in all of my talks. I, I really love it because it shows us how dynamic uh, the human brain really is in terms of the activity patterns that unfold. And one of the core questions, I think in our field, but especially also in my lab has been over the years, how do we get from the left to the right? What is it about the patterns that we see, the regularities uh, that we see in functional connectivity that we can uh, that we can understand by taking a look at the anatomy and the generative models that translate anatomy into this dynamic patterns that you see here on the right. Of course, we all know, and I will go through this very quickly, uh, about resting state networks, uh, and they have been uh, with us now for a dozen years at least, maybe a little bit longer. Um, uh, we take a movie of the kind we've just saw, with, that we've just seen, we cut it up into frames, single snapshots of activity, bold patterns uh, on, on the cortical surface. We create a correlation matrix, typically. Uh, functional connectivity is still in our field largely a, uh, a partial or, or full correlation, here's some correlation of bold time series. And as you all know, if we do that in resting state over a sufficient amount of time, we can get very reproducible patterns from these FC, from these FC matrices that are uh, relating to things that, you know, networks that sub, sub parts of this matrix that you see here as blocks along the main diagonal. They now have names like default mode, control, of dorsal attention, limbic saliency, somatomotor visual, et cetera. This architecture is quite constant, despite the fact that resting state itself is, is fairly un, um, unconstrained. And that was initially, as I recall, in the late 2000s, really a shock to the, to, to the field. Um, uh, but it has been established over and over again. Uh, as you all know, there have been canonical studies uh, carried out by uh, Jonathan Power at, uh, at WashU and Thomas Yao at the time at MGH that have looked at a large cohort of subjects and have come up with very consistent 
patterns of functional connectivity resting state networks that map onto the cortical surface. Uh, and these, these, these resting state networks have become, of course, the bread and butter, really, of or one of the bread and butter, if, you, if that makes sense, of cognitive neuroscience. In our own lab, we were interested in where they come from and what can account for their shapes and, and particular topographies. And we've taken recourse to building generative models of functional connectivity, generative in a sense that they create data such as bold, simulated bold time courses that we can directly relate to empirical recordings. One way that we have done that is by taking a so-called neural mass model, a biophysical neural model of what neural populations do over time, and implemented that on top of the coupling matrix, which comes directly from an anatomical data set, such as in this case, the track tracing data from the macaque monkey, at the time a binary undirect, a binary directed matrix. And when we compare these simulated patterns we get from such a biophysical neural mass model shown here in the diamond on the right to empirical data on the left of this diamond, while not perfect, and how, it, how could it be, there is some agreement uh, between uh, the patterns that we see in simulation versus the patterns that we see in empirical resting state recordings, in this case of macaque cortex. In humans, uh, a structural connectivity matrix here at the top, uh, we've gone a few steps further with, with Joaquin Goni from a postdoc in my lab uh, to, to devise actually analytic network models that can predict functional connectivity directly in MATLAB uh, once uh, under, under a second uh, from a structural connectivity matrix can directly predict functional connectivity. On the right is the predicted pattern, on the left of this diamond is the empirical pattern, and the agreement is remarkable given that the analyt analytic network model is actually quite simple and straightforward, re resulting essentially in, or resulting essentially from uh, established graph theoretic measures such as path length and search information. One thing that occurred to us when we were looking at our simulations back in 2006, 2007, is that the, that brain activity and activity patterns, even in simulation, where we cannot, uh, where, where there's no external stimulation or any other, any variation, internal state, cognitive state, or heartbeat, or what have you, those patterns are quite variable. And we proceeded back then to start windowing our time series and look at graph theoretic metrics like the centrality of particular regions in functional connectivity. What we discovered to some extent to our uh, surprise was that these graph theoretic metrics, the, the hubness, the centrality of areas such as uh, prefrontal cortex area 46 or visual area V4, those uh, uh, metrics changed and went up and down on time courses that were quite, uh, on time scales that were actually quite slow. Uh, look, this is a time scale here of about 10, 15 minutes of, of, of real time. And we're seeing ups and downs that are on the order of 30 seconds, uh, a minute or two minutes. Uh, and there's nothing in the system equations that we simulated that, that accounts for that time scale. So we're getting fluctuating uh, functional connectivity architecture in simulation on very slow time scales in the absence of any external stimulus influence variability or anything like that. Uh, resting state indeed is fluctuating and is variable, at least uh, that is one of the lines of evidence that many people have, have pursued. And I have a few of the key references down here I've given up to, to list anymore because there are just too many of them at this point. And especially the work of Gustavo Deco, uh, uh, Victor Yerza and others have built on uh, built, have built a whole framework of dynamic functional connectivity, uh, where dynamics is characterized, for example, by multi-stability exploration of a functional state repertoire and even near criticality. Uh, there's a lot of literature uh, that has reported on fluctuations in functional connectivity over time. For example, between states of relative segregation, low efficiency, low connectivity between uh, functional systems and other states where there's more integration, high efficiency, uh, greater connectivity between systems. Uh, our own uh, theoretical framework here, um, you know, coming out of our simulation work, uh, in, important work here by Andrew Zaleski and uh, Michael Breakspear, uh, many years ago now, looking at uh, fluctuations between low and high efficiency states in the human brain during rest, and of course, very important work. Uh, Max Schein and Russ Poldrack uh, at Stanford at the time, uh, looking at uh, segregation integration um, 
changes between segregated integrated brain states in the context of both rest as well as task related functional connectivity and dynamics. Uh, so this segregation integration um, dichotomy has been with us for quite some time. Most of the studies um, that, that, I'm, that I was familiar with until recently have been carried out on windowed functional connectivity, looking at short segments, 30 seconds, maybe a minute or so, running a window across the fMRI time courses and then looking at what the instantaneous or the windowed state of the functional connectivity looks like. Um, in, our own, in our own work, we have done studies like that until fairly recently. My former postdoc, Makoto Fukushima, started looking at fluctuations in modularity across time, uh, devising a fairly stringent null model to exclude uh, stochastic or random fluctuations and to focus on moments that are not explained by, by the null model, high and low uh, modularity states, isolating them, looking at two different uh, uh, data sets, MKI and HCP, and what we found, what Makoto found was that a high and low um, modularity states had remarkably consistent topography between these two different data sets. Essentially, they consisted of a pattern that uh, way where we had on one side, a default mode frontoparietal systems, highly cohesive uh, amongst, amongst each other, uh, but not, uh, but decoupled really from, uh, from sensory and attention systems on the other side. In that dichotomy, you can see it perhaps most clearly in these high uh, modularity states here, uh, was found also in, uh, was found in both data sets and seemed to recur uh, during certain episodes uh, during resting state. Now, the, the, now we've done something different since then. We have moved away from windowed functional connectivity analyses um, and moved into a new space, largely as a result of some innovations done by my former um, grad student, Josh Faskiewicz and my colleague, Rick Betzel here at IU. The idea is as follows, and this is where I go into so-called edge time series. Our classic functional connectivity is still to this day largely based on the similar, on a simple assessment of you know, linear similarity, Pearson correlation of node um, time series, old activation patterns. And one way that the Pearson correlation is defined is it's actually nothing, nothing else but the, the mean of the normalized um, momentary products between each of the, of the time courses that you look at. Um, the proposal that, that Josh and Rick came up with a couple of years ago is that we can unwrap the Pearson correlation, which gives us essentially just one value for each node pair. We can unwrap that into a time series that we call edge time series that reports the momentary co-fluctuations of each edge over time. Over here on the left is what we are all familiar with, bold time series. So that's one region and that's the second region. And the edge between them, the putative functional connection from I to J and, and J to I is the Pearson correlation of these two, which when we unwrap it is this edge time series. So the mean of all the values plotted here over time is identical, mathematically equal to the functional connectivity of that edge. Now in most of most work I'm familiar with, people have been focusing on functional connectivity, Pearson correlation, but they have not performed this unwrapping step. The unwrapping step discloses momentary co-fluctuations across the brain, which we can now plumb for additional features in our data. That's the rest of my talk today the kinds of things we've been trying to do with that construct. Um, here's what this looks like if you just plot a, uh, an edge by time matrix. Each edge, each row in this matrix would be one ij edge, which if we take the mean of all the values along the row would be one fc value. Uh, the columns on the other hand are time points as a conspicuous feature here, which are those vertical stri stripes that run through. Hold, hold your horses for just one minute. I'm gonna come back to those in just a minute. If we take the mean of this uh, edge by time matrix along the time dimension, we get a vector, which when we reshape it and fold it back into square form, we get a familiar functional connectivity matrix. Very important to realize that uh, functional connectivity is nothing else but the mean of all points in time of these of this edge by time matrix. It's exactly equal to that. What Josh and Rick did in, in their original study and, and subsequent work uh, is to actually take this construct forward and build an edge function of connectivity from that, which you can do. This is a truly large matrix because it is essentially n square by n square. And 
uh, much can be learned from uh, looking at edge functional connectivity, for example, overlapping uh, communities of edges uh, uh, that map back onto the brain in very interesting ways. I will leave that line of work aside, although I would encourage you if you're interested to, to look at those original publications if you want to know more about all this. I'll return to the uh, actual edge by time matrix. And now I want to talk about these vertical, uh, vertical stripes that you can see fairly conspicuously. We saw them on the screen the very first day when we first plotted this. And of course, our first reaction was, okay, great, we found another fMRI artifact. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, indeed, we were quite concerned for a while that this was due to motion, perhaps head motion or some other unwanted physiological um, uh, nuisance variable. Each one of these columns in the matrix is one point in time. And uh, what we can do is we can compute a um, simple summary statistic of the amplitude across uh, each of these columns. We chose to, to do that using the, the RMS statistic. And what you now see is that clearly there are these sort of, you know, there are moments when the RMS amplitude is not particularly remarkable, but then there's brief, brief occurrences when the amplitude of the signal is, is quite high. And we called these somewhat, um, not so fortuitously, perhaps, we call these uh, moments events. So now you refer to events, what I'm referring to is these brief spikes or, or moments of time when the amplitude of co-fluctuation in the brain is quite high. Um, we, uh, we found these, as I mentioned, we, they are unrelated. We've pretty much done everything we can to exclude these possibilities, the unrelated head motion, or cardiac respiratory cycles or any other, in our hands at least, unwanted um, <clears throat> measurement or physiological artifact. Uh, we do find them in really all individuals we've ever looked at. Um, we can also get them from standard bold time series. If the edge time series concept is suspect to you, you can get them directly from bold. They're short lasting, um, brief, intermittent, and uh, separated by quite some time actually on a typical resting state scan. Of course, you wanted to know where they come from, what they might signify, what they might have to do with FC as we classically are used to it. So we did a few analyses uh, rather quickly. For example, we looked at what does the FC look like uh, right around when these events occur. We can, we, can, we, can, we can examine that question by taking event related patterns of co-fluctuation uh, and see whether they correlate with classic FC, the classic FC pattern that we obtain from taking the mean over all of these columns all at once. Um, as you know, Pearson correlation is immune to shuffling the timestamps of the, of the frames that you're computing the correlation over. So we can shuffle them every which way. So we shuffled them in the order of RSS or RMS amplitude. And if we perform the averaging step from left to right or from right to left, we see that if we first start averaging, taking the highest events and averaging them together, we approach the FC pattern, the full FC pattern very quickly with 10%, 20% of the data, we get very close to what the full FC during a full resting state scan tells us. If we start from the other direction with low RSS or RMS frames, uh, we do not nearly as well. So that uh, says that the full FC, as we are used to, as we are so used to now in our work, is actually driven by, is largely, um, can largely be accounted for by a very small number of time samples uh, coming from high amplitude co fluctuations. That also means that these event frames, the times, the moments in time surrounding high amplitude co fluctuations, really are driving what we are so familiar with from classical functional connectivity architecture, the uh, you know, resting state networks that are enshrined in cognitive neuroscience at this point. They come for, they're largely driven, determined if you wish, by these high event, high, high amplitude event frames. Non-event frames are much less prominent. They are much more variable from each other, incidentally. They're much more heterogeneous and uh, they do not drive the architecture as much. If we look at the um, uh, event signature and project it back onto the cortical surface, it reminds us very much to, of the, you know, the celebrated gradient, so-called. Uh, um, you can discuss later on what that might be and why I say so-called um, on the cortical surface, uh, which is a, a mode of activity 
that is uh, this can be described as a co-fluctuation of control and default mode networks on the one side and uh, some other sensory and visual and, and attention networks on the other side. That reminds us, of course, of the high modularity patterns that we've discussed earlier in the work that Makoto did. Um, the plot thickens when we go to movie data. Resting state is one thing, but I, for various reasons, uh, I'm personally quite fond of using more naturalistic stimuli to drive the brain and movie Passive movie watching is one such paradigm that I think is very promising in that regard. Uh, in looking at movie data, what we see is that these high amplitude co-fluctuations, these events that I showed you earlier, uh, shown here across 29 subjects watching the same movie, uh, uh, scanned separately, of course, are um, aligned with each other, are somewhat aligned in time, um, seemingly aligned to, these, to the stimulus, uh, which is the movie that they're watching. Uh, this alignment is not observed when we're looking at uh, resting state, obviously, that's a good control. Um, this uh, intersubject correlation of uh, amplitudes uh, of these particular states across time is very intriguing to us and is being addressed currently by work, Gideon Leverkov, grad student over in Israel, and Jake Tanner, grad student with uh, Rick Betzler, working on, on this very actively, looking at how, do we, how, does, it, how, how does this event synchronization uh, relate to the movie content. Um, how does it map onto the cortex? What are intersubject differences? Are there any, and, and are they significant? And uh, how does how might this how might this moment in time relate to cognitive constructs and operations that might occur at those moments in time? Um, a very important paper came out just recently uh, from uh, uh, the lab of Adil Wazi over in Australia in which uh, they critically examined the usefulness of the edge-centric or edge time series paradigm uh, for functional connectivity. And they made a few very important points that I want to reiterate here because I think they're quite correct and very important to make. A covariance matrix is a portrait of the dynamics. It does not preserve the blow-by-blow -blow account of what goes on in time, but it does preserve a summary picture of what the dynamics look like. So we can, in fact, infer much about the dynamics of a process by decomposing it, for example, into eigenvectors where the events that we've just discussed in our own work with edge time series actually are very much re resembling identical, if you wish, to the leading eigenvectors of such a decomposition. A lot of the results that we've just talked about, for instance, the predominance of a few moments in time, the fact that those moments in time drive uh, functional connectivity have been confirmed, in fact, mathematically are obligatory when you have certain covariance matrix structure. And um, to me, that does not take away from the validity or the importance of the edge time series construct. And here are the reasons why I say that. First of all, I don't think that people realized in our field that functional connectivity was indeed driven by just a few samples across time or could, could be reconstructed from 10% of the data with very high accuracy. That was not appreciated widely in our field. At least I'm not familiar with that uh, before uh, we hit upon this in our own work. Mathematical analysis that Novelli and Raz carried out really confirms our main findings and even gives a mathematical rationale for why this must be so. I think this is a win-win. Uh, edge time series are quite simple. They do not require any new processing data constructs. There's no windowing involved here, which as we know has some free parameters that are quite gnarly to, to, to guesstimate. Uh, there are no statistical manipulations needed, no additional processing or anything. It's the same data that we use to compute classic FC. It's just minus one step to correlation itself. Unlike functional connectivity, and also unlike the null models and analytic decompositions proposed by uh, Adil's work, edge time series do have temporal specificity. Those events that I showed you earlier occur at certain moments in time and not others. That is important. I do not believe that these are just stochastic instances that we happen to be measuring, you know, magically manifesting from the brain at certain random moments. No, it's actually a reflection, I think, of what the brain is doing at that moment or the moments before. Of course, with fMRI, we have that um, uh, HRF in there. Um, fluctuations in brain state are now localizable with edge time series to an unprecedented degree down to one uh, TR. Um, 
sorry, um, the, the next point here is that let's remember that um, functional connectivity depends uh, in first, and first it has to be there, the brain has to create it. So there has to be a generative process, a series of dynamic states, brain activity has to occur for there to be a functional connectivity matrix in the first place. So in some ways, what's been shown in this paper is that once, you, once the brain has done its work, you can actually dig out some pieces of what's been going on from the resulting covariance matrix. But if you don't have the covariance matrix, if the brain isn't doing its generative work, then you, then you have got nothing. Uh, so uh, what we have also shown, and this is a large part of what I'm going to talk about in just a minute, is that the uh, generative process, the existence of events and of particular signatures and events depends on the presence of modular networks in the brain. That's work by my grad student, I hope I'll come to that in a second. Work by, my, by one of my other grad students, Sarah Katz, is uh, actually trying to utilize edge time series to filter fMRI time series and to enhance signatures of individual differences and brain behavior relationships. So these two issues that we can pursue with edge time series, I now want to um, proceed. Before I do that, I want to show you a movie. Um, on the top here is a matrix, uh, 200 node by 200 node standard, you know, FC matrix, if you wish, except it's not the functional connectivity I'm showing you here. For each moment in time, for each frame, you'll see this, this increase in just a moment. What you see is the momentary co-fluctuations that are projected onto that n by n matrix. The mean of all these frames in that little square up here is the functional connectivity. The uh, uh, squares along the main diagonal are our classic functional connectivity systems default mode to visual. Down below, we're going to start building up the edge time series and then be below that, the RSS amplitude. As I turn this on, Please pay attention to the patterns of co-fluctuations, positive meaning things are going together in time, synchronized if you wish, and how they align to the boundaries of those classic functional systems. There's not a moment in time when all of these functional systems are equally strongly expressed. Instead, each moment in time, each frame here at 720 milliseconds coming from HCP data, highlights a particular subset of the architecture, if you wish. Sometimes one system shows up very coherent, some other sensory just here. Sometimes multiple systems seem to join together and are briefly expressed in time. We can track all of this from the edge time series and down below from the RSS summary statistic. So this is a, uh, a view of um, what, I would, what I call, what I, I like to call fine scale fMRI dynamics that we didn't have before, in my opinion. Um, this construct here um, of edge time series and those fluctuations, we will now take forward and do a few exercises with in the last remaining uh, 20 minutes or so. The next picture shows you the exact same edge by time matrix that we just saw constructed for us in that movie. And over here is the actual functional connectivity. That's the mean of all those frames in the upper um, square that I pointed out to you. That's familiar to us, that's Pearson correlation. It's coming from this construct here. A couple of years ago, when I was holed up in, in isolation and locked down in my home office, it occurred to us that we could um, actually binarize this time series, which is continuous, of course, uh, into a, um, a, a, a matrix of zeros and ones, a binary matrix. This is a great compression, really, of the continuous data into a very compact binary format. It turns out that uh, the mean of this matrix here is exactly, virtually is exactly equal, 0.96 correlated to the functional connectivity. We can actually reconstruct functional connectivity from a binary pattern of um, thresholded, binarized all time series. This was a bit surprising to us at the time. It turns out, as Novelli and Rasby have shown, it follows from mathematics that this should be so. This is important because we can use this construct, the binary construct, as a tool for optimization and machine learning purposes, much better than using a continuous uh, matrix uh, shown above. I'll give you an example a little later. We can also use this binary construct to um, look at whether functional systems are strongly expressed at certain moments in time or not, whether they're co-fluctuating and whether the rest of the brain is co-fluctuating in a different way. We, we, we use so-called so templates, system templates that, for example, in, in, this, in this case of the template shown here, 
would consist of the visual system co-fluctuating coherently and the rest of the brain co-fluctuating coherently, but them not being coherent with each other. Using this as a template, we can pass this template along the binary pattern that I showed you in the previous slide and compute the mutual information between this pattern and the pattern that we've empirically recorded. This gives us an index for how clearly expressed the visual system is at any moment in time. So it's a very simple operation really. Uh, and we have provided code on, on our website for, uh, for how to do this. This gives us now a, a time series of, similar, of how similar the binary pattern is to any of, in this case, 63 templates that define all of the seven uh, functional networks and their relationship to each other. So for each moment in time, we can, we can point to it uh, to this time series, we can say which of these functional systems is highly expressed. As you can see quite clearly from the time series down below, um, these systems are not continuously expressed. They, they blink into and out of existence as we, as we go along. This was evident in the movie, I think, as well. Uh, and it also sets up the following possibility. We can now take our fMRI time series and we can filter it. Let's say we, we were interested in template 63, the co-fluctuations of limbic, quantiparietal, and default mode together as a coherent unity. When does that occur? That will be the red, uh, uh, the red line down below. We can filter out all those moments in time when that um, relationship is, is peaking or is, or is high. And we can take those moments in time and we can, we can use them going forward for FC type analysis. Uh, here's a different representation of how functional systems behave across time. You've seen it in the movie. This is essentially the same representation, but now unfolded in a matrix. Uh, take the top row, for instance, the visual system. Is it present as a co-fluctuating system? Not continuously. There are brief moments when it, when it is. These are uh, Z-scores. These are, these are the, the, red, the red moments in time, if you wish. But there's long episodes when the visual system effectively is not evident from the uh, ball time series and the, and the edge time series that we construct from it. Uh, this gives us a way to um, decompose a resting state or other functional connectivity, uh, fun functional MRI recording into uh, moments in time when certain systems are expressed strongly and other systems are not. Going forward now to uh, the two lines of work I outlined, uh, I mentioned earlier, we were interested in whether we could we went in seeing whether we could simulate uh, these fluctuations, whether we would actually see them in simulations uh, of uh, uh, classic sort of brain uh, dynamic systems type uh, 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 simulations. This is the work of Maria Pope of the last uh, couple of years. Can we find events in similar dynamics? This would be important to demonstrate because the simulations have no external stimulus, they have no heartbeat, there's no cognitive state, we think. and uh, there's, there's nothing driving, uh, externally driving these events uh, uh, to occur. It turns out, long story short, that yes, we see them, and we see them even in the most simple of models, the Kuramoto model, which is a phase oscillator, as some of you might, may know, doesn't even have uh, any biophysics in it. It's just a, a, a set of rotating uh, phase oscillators that are, can, that are coupled to a structural coupling matrix. Um, the workflow here is we, we take a, an, a, a structure connectivity matrix, simulate it, um, pass the activity through a HRF to get simulated low um, frequency components of analogous to bull time series, get edge time series from that, and then compute our standard statistic of RSS amplitude. We're getting event-like peaks to occur spontaneously in such a system. They have very similar features as the ones that we see in empirical data. And furthermore, as Maria showed in her work, uh, the uh, patterns that we can extract from when these events occur, the function and connectivity patterns that we can extract when events are occurring, they align very um, closely with underlying boundaries of structural modules. If we indeed destroy structural mod modules or we wire in artificial modules, we find no events in the first case when we destroy them and events that are very closely aligned to the modules we wire in. So in our hands, at least in these simulations, the occurrence of these event-like patterns is driven by the underlying 
by underlying synchrony in clusters of intensely coupled sets of regions that we might describe as clusters or modules, structural modules or clusters that are underneath in the architecture. The second line of work is the work uh, that was done by uh, my grad student, Sarah Cutts. Uh, she came to the lab interested in individual differences. And since we had just hit upon the edge time series construct, we set out to ask, can we use edge time series to localize fingerprints cortical fingerprints, uh, highly reproducible patterns of individual variability. Can we localize these in both space and more importantly in time using edge time series as our construct? You all know the work by Emily Finn, uh, uh, fingerprinting uh, a, a way of, of defining or identifying sets of functional connectivity features or edges that are stable within individuals across multiple fMRI sessions and variable between individuals. Uh, perhaps uh, we can count, we can call them fingerprints because of that, as Emily showed and others uh, have since uh, shown as well, and, and we actually reconfirmed in our own study, these edges are spatially localizable to the fundoparietal and attentional systems for the most part. What we had looked at also in earlier work with my uh, former postdoc Cleo Pena was whether these fingerprints actually varied and in windowed fMRI data over time. And we found evidence that they do also work by uh, uh, Goni and Amico in the same direction, especially in Rico's recent work. Um, our basic idea for Sarah's study was let's look for fingerprints in edge time series by filtering time points, extracting 10% or so of all samples and reconstructing uh, corresponding FC components and then, comp and then scoring those as we would score the original FC matrix. That is looking at the similarity of those um, uh, patterns within the individual across session and then looking at whether they were different from other individuals. Uh, we, we were using a, a whole um, range of different filtering criteria and two different metrics and identifi identifiability and accuracy. We employed also an optimization strategy to identify good filtering strategies um, without any uh, initial guess as to what the filter might look like. We, we used our um, we used uh, two different data sets, multiple measures, distance measures, as well as uh, filtering, and null models and cost validation as well. The paper has just come out in the cortex if you're interested. Here's our basic uh, workflow. We start from edge time series and also from their uh, binary uh, bipartition patterns, which, as I pointed out earlier, can be produced with functional connectivity to an astonishing degree, 0 0.96, 0 0.98 correlation. Classic work by Finn has looked at fil essentially filtering the edge time series in, a, in the horizontal dimension, looking at particular edges and whether they are predictive of individual variability or not. We are doing a different uh, type of filtering. We're filtering vertically uh, in the time domain across the whole brain in this case getting functional activity components and then scoring them for uh, individual differences uh, within individual across session versus between individual across session. That sets up the classic identifiability metric and accuracy, which have been used in prior work. We can use different criteria to filter. We can use RSS amplitude. This is one of the most obvious ones to use, but also we can use our templates to construct mutual information time series and filter um, time point, points in time based on their similarity to particular configurations of functional architecture. First, turning to the RSS amplitude, what we find is that uh, in different uh, deciles, the top decile containing events uh, over here on the left, uh, going to the bottom decile, which contains non-events, uh, the identifiability and accuracy will vary systematically, interestingly, in different patterns, going up and down for accuracy, going just uh, monotonically down for, identify, uh, for identifiability. Um, so the first point is that sampling different moments in time, as this procedure will do, will give you different outcomes when it comes to identifying um, fingerprints. Fingerprints are not as visible using identifiability when we look at the lower amplitude frames, they're more contained in those high amplitude frames. Templates are ways for us to uh, probe for particular configurations of functional architecture, for example, a visual system against the rest of the brain, or in this case, ventral attention system against the rest of the brain. These templates are sort of like lures or sticky bits of paper we throw into the fMRI time series to pull out certain moments in time when uh, more, when, when, when during that moment, the activity pattern of the brain, the co-fluctuation pattern most resembles that particular template. 
what you can see here is that with some templates, um, and they're numbered here, and I can't explain for lack of time what these numbers refer to, unfortunately, we can actually do better than in terms of identifiability and fingerprinting than if we were using the whole FC run. So we can uncover better signatures of identifiability using 10% of the data if we use particular filtering strategies. Uh, the, the use of all FC frames gives us only a certain level of performance and we can exceed that when we use a properly configured template to fish out particular points in time. If we perform an optimization, that is we now let that template be optimized, be um, configured uh, according to an objective function, which is in this case identifiability, we can do much better than the full data set with only 10% of the frames. The bipartitions that we pull out with this technique have consistent architecture. It's 24 different runs of the same algorithm. And they identify moments in time when fingerprinting metrics are optimal that are actually not aligned with RSS amplitude peaks, but they do seem to consistently home in on the same moments in time. So these are moments in time, if you, if you wish, when your brain is, more, is more, dif more different to other brains in the sample, while at the same time being more constantly doing what it's doing across different sessions. Um, we have, uh, of course, taken great care, at least we think we've taken great care to not overfit, um, uh, train these models on half the data, held out half the data, and then um, looked at whether um, uh, the, there's transfer of performance and there is. Um, to just summarize this part of the talk, um, in our hands, what this means is that full FC, looking at full FC as your basic construct actually partly obscures things like cortical fingerprints, uh, or more generally perhaps obs obscures, can obscure individual differences that perhaps are very meaningful in the context of a clinical sample. Uh, instead, uh, if we look at more fine-grained analysis, looking only at a fraction of the moments in time that the, that, that the session actually comprises, but we, 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 we select them according to particular criteria, we can do better than the full FC. Uh, individual differences, uh, as uh, reported uh, by Emily Finn and others over the years, seem to be expressed differentially across time. So your brain is more um, individual if you wish at certain moments in time and less so at other moments in time. Uh, this builds on work that was done by Cleo Pena, but also by Enrico Amico and, and Joaquin Goni were not the only ones to, I think, make this particular claim. The nice thing about the Edge Time series is that we can really home in on single TR resolution moments in time. We don't have to do windowing or anything like that. Um, that's the point I wanted to make here. Single TR resolution, we don't have to do, we don't have to do windowing. And um, that, that to me is a great relief. I never particularly liked this approach because there are so many free parameters, window size, tapering, um, you know, um, sampling rate, overlap, uh, things that uh, really are not, not ideal. Um, if this filtering approach uh, uses the edge time series, and what's important here is that we have to obviously use a filtering criteria and what's our filter, and that can be RSS amplitude, easily computed. It can also be the similarity of each moment in time to a particular configuration of functional networks. That's our templates that I showed you. And that allows you, that allows you to, 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 to really operationalize this approach in a very flexible manner. You can construct different filtering criteria depending on your design, your study, your question that, you are answer, that you're asking, and then uh, explore the data. Um, the use of bipartitions of a binary uh, representation of the old uh, session uh, is, a, first of all, a great compression of the data into, into binary format, but also it allows to use uh, you know, fast optimization methodologies such as simulated annealing as we've used evolutionary algorithms and other machine learning uh, technology to get patterns out from the data that perhaps you had never access to because you didn't do that edge time series decomposition. We have work in progress in the lab. Um, I wish we were farther along, but it takes longer than, than you think, um, uh, to look at brain behavior relationships and also to apply edge time series and the filtering approach to clinical applications. And that is work in progress. Uh, and I'm curious to, to hear also from, from your side what you might be interested in, how you might 
CDH time series approach, a filtering approach to be useful in your own work. One last point I want to make, uh, one last line of work I want to briefly introduce done by, uh, again, my two grad students in this case, Thomas Varley and Maria Pope. That's very dear to my heart because it gets into an area that I actually in some ways started out in 30 years ago, that is multivariate information theory. So building on very old work that I was involved in, I'm the S in TSE actually here um, on complexity uh, published in 1994, before some of these guys were even born, um, uh, is actually uh, leveraging multivariate information theory to understand something about the um, uh, higher dimensional, higher order interactions among multiple units in the brain, multiple subsystems. And there's been some recent resurgence of work in this area, which I've been very excited about work by uh, Andrea Lupi, Rosas, Marinats, or others in the field who have pushed this approach in new directions. And uh, with Thomas's and Maria's uh, uh, leadership, we've, we've taken on a, we've taken a stab recently at extending um, multivariate information theory in a, in, a, in a new direction, building on the work that others have done. I, I would really want to emphasize the contributions of especially the, the folks that I mentioned here. Um, we've talked about integration segregation as a major axis of variation in brain dynamics. We've, this has been, been sort of around for like almost 20 years now. And we now feel that we can extend or perhaps expand on this framework in a very different direction by focusing on a different dichotomy, that between redundancy and synergy. Think of redundancy as uh, information integration um, uh, among source information that are actually identical. The same stuff over and over again, that's redundant. But synergy is the opposite. It's integration of information from different sources where the information is, is unique and unique to the source it comes from, but yet integrated in the system that you're looking at. Synergy is much less intuitive, has been much less explored in the brain. We have taken a stab at it. We found a link between synergy and total correlation complexity analytically, actually, that, that is sort of in this figure on the left. And on the right, we've looked at identifying synergistic subsets, sets of brain regions that are actually engaging in synergistic interactions during resting state. And they are mapped, shown here mapped on the right. We've done this in two different data sets. We've done this um, in, in multiple different ways and have just recently submitted a paper on this, which is also on archive. While this is a little different from the edge time series that I talked about earlier, it gives us yet another stab at under, trying to unpack functional connectivity, not across time in this case, but across, if you wish, different dimensions of information uh, integration and transfer. Redundancy on the one side, heavily emphasized in our field, functional connectivity is redundancy dominated, you might say, and synergy on the other side, much underappreciated. And we're trying to make uh, a stab at, at, at establishing synergy in our field more, um, more um, in a more principled way going forward. I've come to the end. I want to just briefly say, um, um, just briefly wrap up with a sort of one of my big picture slides here. How, how, how am I thinking about um, how these different domains of connectivity interact with each other? I do strongly believe in the importance of structural connectivity as a skeleton. As, a, uh, as an underlying uh, scaffold within which dynamics can unfold. The original proposal of the connectome in 2005 was deliberately aiming to understand and, and, and map structural connectivity in its entirety. That's the original connectome proposal. Um, in the connectome, we then have communication events, signaling events between brain regions, neurons, uh, neural populations that occur along external pathways and synaptic co uh, connections. The sum total of those events, the, 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 the firestorm of activity that unfolds every millisecond in our, in our heads, gives rise to time series that we can then record and, and in turn process into functional connectivity. The functional connectivity that we, that we record in, in, in bold fMRI, but also in neurophysiological recordings, really is the sum total effect of what's going on in terms of communication between different sources and elements in the brain. I want to I emphasize that functional connectivity is an outcome in itself. It is not something that just sits in the brain and has to be read out. It is what the brain does. It isn't a construct in that sense, a, a, a dynamic pattern that occurs as a result of all these interactions that occur within the connectome. Um, we can make progress, I think, much more progress in unpacking functional connectivity on much finer scales. And I'm hoping that the talk I've given today provides some ideas for how that might actually occur. 
I, uh, I, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say I'm actually exactly on time. That's amazing. <laughs> and I, uh, I, uh, I, I wanted to, to say thank you, first of all, for the invitation. I hope that some of this was useful and interesting, especially the last half hour. And I look forward to your questions. I see there are many questions in the chat. So uh, over to you, Leanne, and maybe um, you know, I'll see if we can unpack some of the questions um, and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Olaf. This is the real tour de force. Uh, I can see it's inspired a lot of people. I'm really looking forward to um, delving into the ideas of using your new techniques in the Connectome project that you're, uh, it's wonderful to have you as a collaborator on to look at applying these techniques in depression and anxiety will be really interesting. But let me turn to questions. We have many. I will ask if those who can stay on want to read them live. Um, Bill Newsom, did you want to read yours or I can I can start it, but just jump jump on. I, I can I can okay. do it. Great. Um, hi Olaf, nice to see you again virtually. Um, I was wondering, you know, if I'm more immersed in the single unit literature, electrophysiology and uh, fluorescence measurements. And there've been quite a few reports in the last several years and that some growing enthusiasm for the notion of traveling waves in the cortex and reports of measuring them in several cortical areas and speculation along with some evidence that they might be involved in memory consolidation or certain aspects of perception. And I'm just wondering whether you in your dynamic brain measurements uh, can, can get, acquire any evidence one way or the other for these traveling waves or whether they're too high frequency and too tightly spatially localized for you to be able to access them with your techniques. Any, any thoughts about that? Thank you for that question. The uh, theoretical construct of edge time series is totally applicable, I should have said this, to really any measurement technique. It's not limited to fMRI at all. In fact, we have used, we are beginning to use edge time series in uh, ECOG and EEG data, but also in single unit data. So um, the notion that you can unpack, um, uh, you know, a, a, summary, a summary metric of dependence, statistical dependence, whether it's correlation or something else into a moment by moment uh, edge wise um, uh, construct, th th this can be done. And your question absolutely um, right, on, right, right on target. I have a suspicion that what we're seeing in the FMI space with these, um, these brief excursions or, or you know, burst like patterns has a, a neurophysiological origin, perhaps in exactly the things that you're mentioning. Um, there is circumstantial evidence that. Uh, events in the movie data, for instance, uh, occur uh, when there are changes in scene or even so-called event boundaries that occur in the uh, in what peer people are actually watching on the screen, and that might suggest that there's uh, something that my preferred my, my preferred interpretation is sort of like a reset, you know, almost like a, a, a right to memory moment where you say now I want to store something about what I've just seen, now I want to go on to the next episode. This, of course, could have very uh, actually a neurophysiological con uh, a correlates. Uh, uh, very, very possible to look into. It's early days in this in this space, and I and if we had access to physiological recordings, perhaps simultaneous with FMI, that'd be great. Well, I, I mean, I, I gathered that you know the events that you were looking at uh, certainly corresponded to likely corresponded to oscillatory events. So maybe your modeling suggests that, but whether those oscillatory events actually travel across the cortical surface or not is probably not measurable I, using I, fMRI. I, I'm a little agnostic in the fMRI space because of the high, um, just the blurriness of the six, spatial blurriness of the signal. I, yeah. I know that there's others out there who are more optimistic about this, um, um, but I'm a little bit uh, I don't think fMRI is the, is the perfect technique to, to look at this, to be honest with you. I think we would need well, thank you. another modality for that. Thank you. Re re thank you. Really interesting talk, Olaf. Thanks, Bill. And uh, Shui Chang, who's a postdoc in the center, has some questions. Hello, Dr. Spons. Uh, thanks so much for this very inspiring talk. I just have a question about your method of co-fatturation index. It seems it's measuring uh, the coactivity of different regions, which is also similarly measured by a method called 
collectivation pattern proposed by Xiao Liu. I was wondering if you could elaborate more on the differences and advantages of your method. And um, a follow up question will be uh, this frame wise, a uh, frame to frame um, collective collectivity or co fatuation method might be super vulnerable to motion. I wonder if your filtering strategy will somehow help with that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Two, two great, great questions. I do believe, um, and we've commented on this in our papers, that caps are, you know, co-activation patterns are related. And if not, if not in, in, in the precise way in which I estimated, they are related in spirit at least. They kind of also look at, you know, momentary co-activity, as you, as you point out, and how those patterns recur across time and, and what else is, 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 is co-active or not co-active. So there is a, there's a clear, and I should emphasize that I, I've sort of emphasized the novelty of what, what we've done. I uh, should have said, and I always forget this, that there's, there have, has been many lines of, lines of work before uh, that, are, you know, that have kind of gone, gone off in the same direction, perhaps with uh, tools and approaches that are slightly more complicated than what, what we've actually pursued here. So CAPS is one of them, and um, there's other, there's bold, there's bars and bold patterns that have been observed, observed before. Um, and of course, there's a great, a large literature on state transitions and uh, trying to extract functional activity states from uh, wind, typically windowed fMRI data using k-means or um, uh, hidden Markov models or something uh, of that nature. Again, the advantage of what we do is we don't have to take, uh, we don't have to make recourse to those more, much more complex frameworks. Uh, K-means is not a favorite of mine, if you ask me, um, uh, or HMMs, uh, which make lots of assumptions and they have lots of free parameters. We, what I, what I really like about what we're, what we're doing, uh, sorry if I'm keep pounding on it, is how simple it is and uh, how, how little we have to specify to actually do what we're doing because. We are just dealing with the time series themselves. We don't have to actually window anything. On your second question, motion has been on our on our minds from the beginning, and I can only report that motion is not uh, a factor in uh, in, for example, the RSS amplitude or the equal fluctuation amplitude. It does not co-vary with that at all. I mean, I, I, 0.05 or something, or 0.03 or something like that. But there's really nothing there, and. Uh, we have even tried to, in response to a reviewer comment <laughs> to our paper, we've actually tried to use motion time series as a filtering criterion. So essentially focus on high motion versus low motion frames, look at identifiability. And uh, we, we do not get um, uh, the that patterns that, that we've reported. Um, we're not getting anything really. So we are fairly um, confident that motion does not play a major role in the empirical analysis. We know for sure it plays no role in the simulations. <laughs> that, that at least I can be, I, I can be sure of. So Thank we you. are fairly confident. I know motion has played a big role in our field, in FMI particularly, but I, um, we are, it, it's, not, it's not happening for us in the edge time series arena at this point, I don't think. Great. Um, Anish, you have, uh, I think, at least one question, maybe two. Hey, Olaf. Uh, thanks for a great talk. Um, yeah, the, the question I was curious about was, was around the, um, the argument you were making that you're, you're kind of better able to recover the, the full structure of the fMRI correlation structure by looking at these epochs of high magnitude in the edge time series. So like the, the basically high magnitude in the second order statistic in the relationship between time series. But my question was, could you do, does that overlap with moments of high magnitude of just first order statistics, just high amplitude deflections in the underlying bold time series? And, and, and if that's the case, you know, maybe you're isolating high SNR epochs from low SNR epochs as, as a way of understanding what's going on. It's a good question. It, it, the short answer is I don't think it does. We've looked at this, if I remember correctly. We've actually looked at this early on. Uh, and we, in fact, exclude, um, uh, just from our analysis side, when we see very high, let's say, very high z-spores in, in, in individual nodes, you know, um, there's a spike in activity, which could well be signal dropout if it's negative or, or some other you know, artifact in the, in the recording. 
we uh, cut those out. We don't count those as events. Um, we actually uh, lay them aside and, and don't consider them. So uh, the short answer is no. And again, um, the fact that 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 these high amplitude, uh, high second order scats um, moments drive the FC is it turns out an analytic uh, result. There's there's uh, there's you know this is not an, an accidental observation. Uh, but it is, it, it's falling out from the math of how the covariance matrix works if you have a particular structure for the covariance matrix. If you have no modules, if you do a simulation and you have, if you de degrade the underlying communities that define sort of the, the cross graining of the brain, if you make, if you do away with them, which you can in a simulation, you do not get uh, of these excursions. Um, you still get fluctuations. But they are now well within the envelope of what is statistically expected, um, and uh, so I, I want to emphasize that uh, while the uh, the result is analytic, is actually expected, if you wish, from co from covariance uh, analysis, that some frames drive um, the FC and others don't. Uh, you only get that driving effect if your matrix has some structure to it. And so this gets me back to the brain has to actually do the work for you and create that structured matrix, which you can then decompose. And yes, you find those, you know, you find the gradient and you find the, the leading eigenvector being similar to events. But, um, but if the brain doesn't do its work, if you take an artificial brain, it has no modules, you will not get those features. Okay, so, um, so there's a, there's a generative process here um, that the brain has to perform uh, and performs presumably during ongoing activity that we can capture with 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 modeling and that kind of takes the mystery away from it um, we do understand fairly close fairly clearly where it's all where it's all coming from but it also allows us to to now dig deeper and say like what is happening at those moments in time or just before those moments in time when we see those events occurring and uh, the movie work in particular has allowed us to dig into that for the first time because we actually have a stimulus to look at. So thanks, Olaf. All right. Uh, I have a question that I'm going to read out. Um, before I do that, just to mention, we officially wrap up in three minutes. So I understand that people need to jump off. Olaf, I think you're willing to stay on for a few more minutes yep. if, if needed. Wonderful. So this, uh, we have two questions from a PhD student who's rotating in our center, Divya. She's from the, in the Stanford Institute for Computational and Mathematical Engineering. And her question is fascinating talk. Um, she says she's relatively new to the field. It's her first year PhD. Um, she's asking, what is the time scale of patterns of brain activation in relation to the time scale we can capture in fMRI? And then when looking at co-fluctuation, would you expect a need to account for delays or lags between brain regions? And that perhaps this is precluded by the strong clustered short path length phenomenon you were describing. That's, That's several point. questions. So I'm gonna to have to unpack that a little bit. So uh, with the edge time series approach, we can um, get down to single, we can take our, our time scale is limited only by the TR essentially. And, and also limited by the autocorrelation present in the bowl signal itself. I mean, one thing is um, uh, there's, there's gonna be some autocorrelation if you, if you take neighboring time frames, right? Neighboring, neighboring frames, you're gonna observe that there's some you know, signal decay, which is on the order of a few seconds. And uh, we can't see much structure below that time scale, okay? And delays in the brain um, in terms of neurophysiological delays are probably much faster than that the order of tens or hundreds of milliseconds at most. In the simulation work, they play a role because we actually implement conduction delays in our um, simulation work, which is carried out at sub millisecond resolution. Um, but the, they tend to disappear, um, those conduction delays tend to disappear once we go to the fMRI signal itself or the synthetic fMRI signal. Having said that, um, the dynamics, you saw the movie I showed you, right? Uh, the, 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 pat, the meaningful fluctuations in patterns really unfold. We can track them on the time scale of about a second or two seconds. And uh, that, you know, unless I missed something in the existing literature, that is, has not, that was not possible until now. 
Uh, windowing typically involves at least 30, 40 samples, which if your TR is one second, that's a half a minute uh, or more that you can have to you know, concatenate together and you get one value for that. That's not very good temporal resolution. We don't need to do windowing. We can track the dynamics of individual functional systems coming into existence, going away, linking with each other at the time scale of, uh, if not single TR, then at least a few seconds. And that's, uh, I think, a, a good step forward to understanding um, dynamics, but also uh, maybe linking with a much faster time scale um, that Bill mentioned earlier about, uh, you know, in, in our physiology. Absolutely. I think that also has the promise for understanding when these um, connections and dynamics are disrupted, being able to get to that faster time scale. Um, Divya has a second component to the question, which is whether you could go into a bit more detail about how you decide to model regional connections as directed or undirected edges. Um, and she's wondering if in some cases you're assuming symmetric connection matrices and whether others warrant use of undirected edges. So in the fMRI space, I am not a great fan of trying to uh, recover directionality, to be honest. I don't see how that can be done, at least, at least not at first approximation. It's, it's very hard to do. So all of FC that data I've shown, the analysis were done on undirected, you know, um, uh, pairwise uh, um, interactions. It is possible to, and, and we've played with it, but not published anything to do to do uh, time lag correlations. You know, basically um, uh, offset the, the, the i and j time courses by one or two TRs and look at that. Um, it is also possible to, uh, to the extent that it's statistically possible, to construct directed relationships using things like transfer entropy. Uh, we have made more inroads with transfer entropy in the neurophysiological space and neural recordings. Why? Because we have more confidence in our estimates of things like entropies and joint entropies than we have in a continuous signal that is uh, poorly sampled in the fMRI space. So what bottom line is, um, in my own work, I try to stay away from directed relationships in resting state fMRI or in, in, in any kind of fMRI data. Because I don't think we have, I, I, I think it's, it's just not something I, I like to get into in, in, my, in my own work. I think that, so everything you've seen with fMRI was undirected. But if you have a neurophysiological signal, an EEG, an ECOG, and a, a population recording, a single neuron recording, then of course uh, it would be important to, to recover directionality. We have done so in some of our other work, but not in the part I've, des I've described here. Great, thank you. I think we'll, we'll formally wrap up and just thank you again for a, a really impactful presentation. Uh, I have one, and of course, one more question coming in. Um, someone's asking for a recording. We did record it, so we will check with you, Olaf, if you're willing for that to be shared. Yeah. Um, maybe just as we're wrapping up, um, would you be willing to speculate in the, if you had a would you consider an ideal data set for looking at how you would apply your techniques to answer kind of clinical questions such as what might you expect to be disrupted in different mental disorders or change and, with treatment? I mean, as, as I'm sure you, many of you here are well aware, clinical data present many challenges. They're often not as abundant as, uh, you know, as perhaps as high quality sometimes as you wish, because for all sorts of reasons. And I've struggled over the years with various collaborations and, and different disorders, most, most uh, recently with Alzheimer's disease. Um, and we have begun to look at our Alzheimer's and you know, MCI data and, and healthy control data in the context of edge time series. And there's really nothing that needs to be, there's no magic component needs to be added to do some of the things I've just outlined. It's just that you need, I think, ideally long recordings, um, as many samples as you can get away with, uh, with for, for resting state, let's say. And it, it helps to have a prior hypothesis as to where to look. Um, everything I've shown was whole brain. A lot of what 
what we could be doing it could be much more constrained on a, on, a, on a set of regions of interest let's say of the specific connections we want to actually probe and it helps to have a prior um, hypothesis as to where you want to look it narrows the search space a lot and diminishes um, concerns about multiple comparisons and, and, and overfitting and so forth. Um, but we're quite encouraged because really anything you can do, anything the field has done in the last decade uh, in terms of looking at clinical cohorts and looking at individual differences, let's say patient control studies for continuous uh, variation of some performance, some behavioral variables, some cognitive variable, we can, we can basically redo it. Um, but now using a, a criterion to, take, to, to kind of denoise the data, if you wish. Um, for fingerprinting, the full FC uh, can be improved upon uh, if you select certain moments in time. You see the fingerprints more clearly if you do that. I, I, I would like to find out, and part of the next couple of years maybe we get to do that, is uh, whether we can improve upon the sometimes disappointing uh, quite frankly, um, lack of findings in the clinical space in functional connectivity. Maybe we can improve on that using uh, the edge the edge time series approach to essentially dig deeper and get better signals that we already possess in our recordings, but we haven't been able to look at yet. So nothing new needs to happen. You just need to dig out the old recordings data you already have, and then. I would suggest performing some of the analyses that I've tried to outline uh, to, to search. And then, of course, be careful about not, um, uh, you know, not, not overfitting and, 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 and engaging in statistical practices that are, that are unsound. But, but it's fundamentally, a new type of exploration cannot be performed. And we want to do some of, the, some of this here on our side. But we would also be very happy to uh, to share insights with you on your side and see what see what can be done with the data that you already have collected. Wonderful. We we'll really look forward to that, Olaf. That's a very um, inspiring note to end on, and I, I, it's it's really been informative. Obviously, had a big impact on the audience. Just hearing how clear it is that you've been able to pull out these much clearer signals in the in the shortest samples. It's really very inspiring. Great. So thank, you. thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate your time and sharing these uh, new insights and findings. Thank you very much. And we'll, of course, keep in touch so we can talk more about these approaches. All right. See you later. Thank bye -bye. you so much and, and have a good rest of your day, everyone. Bye.